had the guys up there to do the circumcision and the whole bit, dietary laws. And so they were calling people into Judaism, and these people were called Judaizers. And they were following Paul around. After he would preach the gospel, they would say, okay, now we're going to work you more into maturity through keeping the laws and the commandments and the dietary codes and the outward laws of circumcision so that you can really be in there with God. And Paul now is feeling a little bit that he's being discredited by these guys. And he's saying, well, we've got letters from the apostles. This is St. Peter right here on the bottom. Read this, you know. And Paul says, well, I don't have any letters. And so he was kind of being discredited by these guys because they had letters from the apostles from Jerusalem. But do you remember what happened in Galatians? You may have remembered that in Galatians what happened was that, that Paul was there and so was, or, uh, and so was Barnabas with him. And they were hanging out eating, you know, with the, with the guys there in Galatia. And they were, you know, observing the, the, they were just eating pork or whatever. They, you know, I don't know if it was pork, but they, but then when, when Peter came down, Barnabas kind of withdrew and, and said, oh, I'm going to eat with only the Jews now because, you know, Jews don't eat with Gentiles. And so he kind of withdrew and played the hypocrite. And what did Paul say? I confronted Peter to his face and I rebuked him. So in the church during this transition, there were, People really thinking that if you're really going to follow God, you got to get all these Gentile converts into Judaism if we're really going to hang with God. So they were doing their part, and now they're seeming to, to undermine Paul's authority and said, you know, and he doesn't take money. What real apostle isn't in it full time and doing money? Paul was a tent maker. He provided his own way. And so he's, he's feeling like, I got to say something about this because these guys are undermining the gospel of grace. And now he's going to break into this thing about law and grace. And he's going to try to make the Christians in Corinth understand what it means to follow Jesus by grace and not the law. And so he begins by saying, are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? And then he breaks into this. You yourselves are our letters, written on our hearts, known and read by everybody. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of the human heart. And Paul now begins to contrast law and grace. Because these people were being threatened to forsake grace to get into the law. And I think that many Christians fall into that temptation. If you really want to follow God, it feels like if you sacrifice to do that, you're more spiritual. But that's not always the case. And so these Christians, they wanted to do anything to be right with God. And so they were vulnerable to these guys coming in and saying, well, you, you, you've accepted Jesus, that's wonderful. But now let's get you circumcised and uh, let's get you eating according to the dietary codes and let's get you into the festivals and all the Jewishness that goes with the gospel. And so Paul is saying to them, I don't have a letter. Now it's interesting to me that Paul's saying that because Paul could say, you know, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. Among those in my own category, I was really at the top of the ladder. I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. And I met Jesus on the road. And so Paul, is what he's doing is he's, he's saying, not only am I not going to play this silly game of letters with authority, I could pull out my card, a Pharisee card, and tell you all about Pharisees and laws. And when I was there, I didn't get you into the law because I was confronted on the road to Damascus. And Jesus said, it's hard for you to kick against the goats. Why are you persecuting me? And Paul could have pulled out his card. You know, I'm ordained. I went, you know, I went to Harvard. And people love to throw titles. Don't we love titles? And I, I'll say to you that I would rather go to a doctor that has the title. But in the things of God, it's like we transfer those same cultural values that are good values. 
you're going to be a counselor, get some good training. If you're going to be a surgeon, get some good training. If you're, if you're going to be a pharmacist, by golly, do it right. Get an A in chemistry. I'll go there and, and you can wait on me. But when it comes to shifting that same cultural value and giving a, a credibility and authority from God in the, in the same capacity by education, Paul says, I'm not going to play that game. I'm not even going there. Even though I could play my card, I'm not going to do it. And so he said, here's what I will tell you. The real, the real test of an apostle is the fruit. Are you not my fruit? Did you not hear the gospel from me? Did you not come into living relationship through God when I came and I proclaimed to you the gospel? And you are my letter, and written not with ink, signed by Peter. You're signed by the Holy Spirit. God has written across your heart the work of my, my son, Jesus, through the work of the Holy Spirit, transforming this life. My son. Yeah. Yeah. So he would rather glory in God than the degree. And I believe that that is a kingdom principle. I'm not against theological education, by the way. And, and we have uh, one guy on our site that has seminary training. And when we say, what does this mean in the Hebrew, we all turn to Andrew. And Andrew goes through it. But Andrew was saying here and tell you, teaching through the Bible once is, is, is a greater education than all of seminary training that I received. He'll tell you that outright. And the rest of us, none of us even have a bachelor's degree except Darren. And uh, so we're just like, like Paul. We would rather, it's fine if you got it. Wonderful. By the way, let me tell you, it's okay if you have it. Some people have misinterpreted what I'm saying. Now, I have encouraged some guys to drop out of school. There's two of our interns who are moving into ministry are three that have dropped out of school because they were incurring debt and their education wasn't going to help them become a pastor or a missionary and so um, they dropped out and they saved a ton of money and the goal is to leave without any debt right that's why we have the internship and so if you're feeling called to ministry you know talk to us because we can you know work with you and thrust you into and put you in a nurturing group as you learn to pastor or get into the mission field. And so that's what we've learned to recognize is that, is that our dependency is on God. Now, God will call some people to go to higher education and some people get to, uh, get to the degree and they leave with no debt and it's wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful. And I tell kids, hey, if your dad's paying for your education at Taylor University, hang in there, man, do it. 26,000 a year? Wow. You know, hey. Or is it more now? I don't know. Do we have graduates here today? <laughs> this is your last week? One? This is not your last week, is it, Jordan? Congratulations to you. I usually have you come up, and I forgot. I was working behind the coffee bar and lost track of everything. But anyway, um, Paul is saying the real thing that authenticates ministry is the fruit. Do you remember when people came up against Moses and Aaron and they said, hey, you know, who are you guys? You think you're special with God? Why? We have the spirit too. Can't we be leaders too? And the Lord got the odd and says, no, you can't. I'll tell you how I'm going to prove this. I want you to take your staff and put it in the presence of God. And I'm going to take Aaron's staff and put it in. And the one who buds and has fruit on it, that's the guy that you're going to listen to because I'm going to, I'm going to stand with that person. They went back the next day, and Aaron's, Aaron's rod had butted and had almonds on it. Dig it. The other guys was plain and, and dead. And God says, is that enough for you? And it's kind of like Paul is saying the same thing. You're my letter. You are the work of God. I'm the secretary. I preach the gospel, and God has backed it up with the fruit of your changed life. And God has written across your heart who he's called you to be. And who he's making you into from what you used to be. And you are God's workmanship. And you are God's letter. And so if you want a letter, look at yourselves. Because I'm not going to play the game. And I could pull my card. And maybe I could even trance this, this hand. But listen. I want you to realize that unless God is backing you, it doesn't matter what degree you have. And God was obviously not backing these other guys. Because Paul's going to call them in chapter 11 a bunch of false apostles. 
Now, he says here that these people are God's work, and, and their hearts were a place for the Holy Spirit to write across their hearts who God was making them into being. And I love it because when a person is called to faith in Christ, and when they come to believe in Christ, old things pass away and new things come. And the things that you think that they would be into, sometimes God changes that. And he writes across their heart what they're to do. And that's why we're always using that term, what God has written across your heart, because you're a living epistle. And God takes unlikely people, such as myself. My mother can tell you my journey is, is, is she, she wondered about me telling her that I was called into the ministry herself. And, and it wasn't that, it, it, it was based on good knowledge of who I was. But it wasn't, you know, based on, on what God was going to make me to be from where I was. And so it's been a long journey from here to there. But it's the writing of God that he says across my heart that I had to come to embrace and believe more than what anybody else's input was giving me at the time. And Paul says, you're those letters. You're a living example of Christ, and his fruitfulness is coming through you. And he says, the scope is to be read by all people. One of the things I think that God likes to do is he likes to take and write and do his work across the hearts of people. Then he likes to put them on display like like a light on a stand. You don't hide it under a bushel. You put it on top of a stand so all people can see it. And so it's almost like, you know, uh, Lindsay paints on Friday nights. And I, 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 I'm going to not be happy that we're not meet, meeting every week because she's cranking out a painting a week, and it's more than she's ever done. And, and I've been crediting myself for getting her into production rate and getting back on track with God's thing, you know? So I'm, I'm like, you know, all right, this is good. She's coming every week. And I love to look at her painting, and, and she usually leaves it out there because she's using oils, and it takes a long time to dry. And then she puts her name across the bottom. And so this is the work that I've done. And God says, you're my canvas. I'm running across your heart. And I'm calling you into being what I'm making you to be on this canvas. And it may not be what you thought. It may not be what other people think about you. But you're my living epistle. And I'm going to put it on a, an easel in the lobby so all can see it. And so you see, this bothers sometimes uh, our thinking because we think, you know, I want to be humble. I don't want to show off. God says, don't, you don't have to show off. I'm going to do it in you, and I'm going to lift you up, and I'm going to put you in a place where other people can see you because I don't want to hide my work. So, and then we see that he breaks into verses 4, and he says, such confidence as this is ours through Christ Jesus before God. Folks, you don't have to go get some sort of degree to have confidence to do ministry. And Paul's saying, I've got confidence, and it doesn't come from a letter. It doesn't come from a degree. Where does it come from? This confidence is ours through Christ before God. I'm standing before God, and he backs me up. And things will come and test it. Uh, just yesterday, I received a really blasting email of Muncie Alliance Church and of me, and, and um, saying, you know, lots of bad things. And I got to thinking about it, and I'm thinking, well, you know, I always want to read this because maybe God wants to say something to me, and I want to hear it. But the person was so angry and slamming that it was hard to get anything good out of it, and then it was so vague, but he knew what he was saying, and you know, he's writing it out and, and to lots of people, like 30 or 40 people, and it's like, what do I do with this? And I just remembered that saying that God gave me when people didn't like me before. <laughs> and the saying was, uh, don't defend yourself. God will defend you if you're worth defending. And if you're not, why bother? But I always want to get something good out of it to change in my life and say, God, I must be off somewhere. I want correction. Bring it on. But it was so bad that um, 
I just decided, well, I don't know what to get out of it. I'm sorry, Lord. If there's something you want me to see here, bring it on. But such confidence is this. I'm standing before you, and I'm living for the audience of one, and I'm not going to change the whole church and deconstruct Muncie Alliance because it's the wannabe megachurch. I don't want to be a megachurch. That's why we have multi-sites. But the whole thing is, is like, I, I, I don't want to change for somebody else's opinion who's pissed off at me. And that's another thing that he said. So he didn't like to use the word piss, so he came up with... Um, set shat, which is the different word for poo that's been sitting for a while. So I, I, I had a good laugh at the same time, but I, I learned to learn, I've got to live and please God, and you, I may love you and like you, but you could give me bad advice like Job's friends, and I could give you bad advice. So you've got to ask God to strain out what I'm telling you. And so, you know, um, Paul says, I've got confidence. Where's my confidence? Is it because the district likes us and our denomination likes us? I'm glad they like us. But that is not where confidence should come. Confidence comes through Christ before God, not that we are confident in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our confidence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of the new covenant. For the law, for the letter, um, not of the letter, but of the spirit, for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. The Ten Commandments on the letters of stone, Paul says, we're not written on the letters of stone. These guys with the letters were pointing to the letters that God wrote, the Ten Commandments on these stones. Now, look at the stone and do your life by the stone. And Paul's saying, what are the stones for? The stones bring death. What do the Ten Commandments do for you? They show you what God expects, and you say, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. I broke the speed limit coming to church. I was mad at the person that cut me off. I don't love my neighbor. And the witness that I felt in my heart that I wanted to bear was not a good one. And I have thoughts of murder on my way to church. I'm dead. And God says, good, the law has done its part. It's killed you. The law is never meant to bring life. The law is to show you that you're guilty, to point you to Jesus, that it comes through grace, through faith, not of works. So no man can boast before God. Keeping the Ten Commandments. Oh, yeah, you won't break them before you get out of the church. So... The letters bring death. So I don't want to point you to the Jewish laws. That's only going to minister death to you and frustrate you and take your pork away from you. And I don't want that. Thank God for grace. Now, if the ministry that brought death, which, has, which, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, now, when the Ten Commandments, God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses, he had been fasting four days. He came down. It came in tremendous glory. As a matter of fact, when he came down the mountain, his face was glowing. And if the ministry, because it is God, the Ten Commandments are not wrong. They're God's thing. It's perfect. The law is perfect. They're not imperfect. We are imperfect. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through your flesh, the law is perfect. It's holy. It's God. It's glory. But what it could not do, because you're weak in your flesh, it couldn't raise you up. So what God did, what the law could not do weakness, according to the weakness of your flesh, God did by sending his own son underneath you to raise you up, to forgive you of your sins, to fulfill the law through the work of Christ on the cross. So the law still has its place only to convict you of your need for Jesus. That's what it's going to tell you in Romans and Timothy and throughout the Gospels as well as the letters that Paul lays out in Galatians. When we get to Galatians, you're going to see it even more clear than this, if you didn't see it in Romans. And he says this, that this law came with this glory, but that law and that ministry condemns. Look at verse number 8 and 9. It says, 
Well, let's back up to seven. If, if the ministry that brought death, the Ten Commandments, brought death, which was engraved on tablets of stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look stead, steadily at the fading, fading, though it was. Will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that condemns men is glorious. Speaking of the law, what does the law do? It condemns you. I, you ever witness somebody, well, you know, I keep the law. It's like, dude, you do not keep the law, and the law condemns you. Do you understand what you're saying? You don't obviously understand what you're saying. The, if the ministry that condemns men is glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? Now, Paul says, what does the ministry of the law bring? Condemnation. What does the ministry of the Spirit bring? Righteousness. And not a righteousness that's of your own ability to do right things, but righteousness that is added to your account through Christ. So the gospel is clear. And if you go to undermine the gospel and point people back to the law after they're saved, you're missing the boat. Don't do that. Don't teach your kids, you know, keep the law. Well, tell them that until they realize they're sinners. And they say, okay, now you've learned. You can't do it. You need Jesus. And the law needs to be preached to sinners saying, hey, you think you're so holy? How about this and this and this? You ever covet your neighbor's car? <laughs> you're broke. If you broke one, you're guilty of all. And you just say, well, okay, what does this mean now? It means you need... Your debt for sin paid for, and that has been done through Christ's death on the cross. Isn't this simple? Aren't you glad? Yeah! <laughs> now, the Spirit's ministry comes with the surpassing glory. For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. You think the law came with glory, and it did, and it's God, and it's holy. It's not the law's problem. It's our problem to keep the law. We can't do it. It was glorious. It came in glory. But now there is a surpassing glory that's shoom, flying by. The law's glory. Because Moses, even though he came down in glory, he himself couldn't keep it and it started fading. Whoa, you're in the presence of God. You're lit up. Really, I don't put oil on my head, and it's really not the glory of God. <laughs> Somebody accused me of that. There's no... And I'm not shining from the glory of being in the presence of God. You know, I was making lattes just before this, and so I, am, I have nothing to say except that there's a surpassing glory that's working in my life that is so far passing. It's like, you know, it's like a turbocharged, you know, superbike passing a moped. <laughs> yeah. And Paul said, the surpassing glory, and if what was fading away with glory, how much greater is the glory of what lasts? Jesus' work on the cross is good for eternity. Eternal life means it starts now all the way through. Even it covers the past of history of people who are looking to God in faith for the sacrifice to be paid for their sin to release them. And it's, it's here to stay, and it's lasting, it's surpassing and increasing glory. Verses 12 through 16. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Paul's saying, well, you know, it could be that you might want to... It's like, no! You want to turn to Jesus now! Boldness. One of the evidences of the filling of the Spirit is many of the gifts of the Spirit, but it's also when they were filled, they went out and spoke the Word of God with boldness. Once you get this down, that it's God's work, not yours, well, He's written across your heart, man, have a new confidence. It, it doesn't matter what you think. It's what God thinks. 
It doesn't matter how many Job's friends that come around you and make you start doubting yourself. Have confidence, not in yourself anyway. Have it in God. And he's saying this. Therefore, because of this surpassing glory, because, you know, of the superbike, the 180-mile-an-hour superbike passing the moped, therefore, since we have a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses who would put a veil on his face. Now, I think if I hopped in the ring with Mr. Holderfield, I would want a veil on my face because I wouldn't want to see people know that it was me getting this horrible beating. I think I'd want to just hide. <laughs> and he's saying this. He said, this is what Moses did. He put a veil on his face because he didn't have confidence. Why? Because his glory was fading. And it says this. Moses, who had put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it, while the radiance was fading away. I don't want people to see this fading away. <coughs> Moses, you lost your shine. Should we follow you anymore? So Moses covered it up. And he says, but the minds, but their minds were made dull. For to this day, the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ it is taken away. The bold confidence that you are to have is in Christ. And the law can only make you feel guilty and ashamed and want to cover up. But he said, and there are people still walking around this with this cover because it's only removed in Christ. Marty Miller in Teaching Full had some really interesting insight about the Jewish wedding feast and the veiling of the bride until the day that they were joined together and then they were unveiled with face to face unashamedness. I thought that was really worth mentioning. And he says this, um, it is even to this day when Moses is read, a veil covers the hearts, but whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. This whole thing about the veil is a very interesting concept in the mindset of how God set it up to be among his people with a veil that would separate him from his people. Only one time, once a year during the Passover, could the priest go in, sprinkling blood on the, on the, um, the altar, the atonement, the seat of mercy, and could he stay in there? And if he didn't do it right, he died on the spot. And they had a rope tied around his leg in case he died because no one could go behind the veil. And this is called making atonement, making at one with, with God, trying to bring God at one with the people and his purposes among the people. And so the sacrifice of atonement, do you remember the veil in, that kept you away from God and God away from you? It is taken away in Christ. What did Jesus do on the cross? Some of his last words were, It is finished! Tetelestai, it's complete. The work is done. And what happened? Bam! The veil in the temple, ripped, torn, top to bottom. God is ripping the veil and saying, It is paid for. Now there's no veil to hide you in shame from God. You don't have to shamefully back off from God. You remember when Adam and Eve sinned, what was the first thing they did? They knew they were naked, and they tried to veil themselves with fig leaves. But in God, Paul says, man, when you come to Jesus, the veil is taken away, and you're standing face to face with bold unashamedness before God, with the confidence that God supports you from heaven. And so, I love this. The veil still remains on lots of people. You know, one of the reasons people don't like God, and I think the church gets a little bit of bad rap. I think it deserves some bad things. Like, people want to say yes to God, but no to the church. There's something to that, folks. That's because the church is acting not like the church is meant to be. 
and it's playing religious games. But a church that has bold unashamedness and allows people to fail, um, that, that church can be real, unveiled before God for transformation. One of the things we do when people come on tour uh, from out of town and they want to look at things, one of the things I like to do is I like to bring them in here as there's several statements that this auditorium itself makes. And Matt designed it with the values of the church. Matt Godfrey designed this, and, and it's, it's plain, but it's adequate and it's nice. It has cement floors. Why? Because people are messy. They spill lattes. <laughs> and we know that as good as you are, we think you're really good people. But you're still human, and you still will knock over your drink. And we have towels. And what are those towels for? It's like, oh, when somebody prophesies or weeps. <laughs> so I always have to explain the towel. No, because we're human, we mess up. And at Muncie Alliance, people always mess up. And it's not just with lattes. But we, we make room for that because people are people. And if we're going to have bold unashamedness as a church to be real before God so God can transform us, we can't hide our sin and veil ourselves. We want to say, yeah, I messed up. Here's a towel right there for me. Right here. And we like natural light. I like natural light. I don't know if you got a vote on that, but I got that in there. It's kind of distracting when cars drive by and stuff, but I'd still rather have light. And I love this whole concept of the veil because God took the veil off. You don't rip the veil off yourself. The veil is taken away from you when you turn to Jesus. No more shame, uh, uh, shamefulness before God. No more fig leaves. You know what fig leaves are? It was man's first attempt at religion to cover himself. And what does religion do? It's man's attempt to justify himself and cover himself up so that he can go in and, and, and gain approval with God. But it's already been dealt with. God has written it across our hearts. And get this next verse, because you're really going to like it. Now, the Lord is spirit. By the way, Danny, thanks for that last song. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Now where the Lord is, uh, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Do you know that we're Trinitarians, meaning that the Holy Spirit is God? Did you know that? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's not God, one God with three manifestations, it's one God in three persons. And the, now, the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled faces, all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory. I'm liking this language of ever-increasing and are being transformed. Why do I like that language? Because I'm not perfect yet. But it's ever increasing and I am on track for ongoing transformation. Folks, I have real problems for people. I, I used to date a girl in a holiness uh, denomination and her mother told me that she did not sin. But I knew she was lying. And I realize that sanctification is, is God setting me apart and it's positional. When I come to faith, I move from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, and that's a done deal. But I also realize that there is a time when I was surrendered to God and was filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, that was a crisis experience. I realize that. But there's also an ongoing transformation in my life. I don't get zapped. You know, you don't just get zapped and have this altar experience where you don't sin anymore. It's just, the Bible just tells you you're, you're just a freaking liar. If any man says he has no sin, he is a liar. Can you say 
Liar. I knew you could. <laughs> so I knew this woman was lying to me. She didn't look very happy either. She's trying to live under a law, and I was happy. And I didn't want to be like her. I wanted to be unavailed before God, not trying to say, well, justify myself. Okay, God, you know, I, I screwed up, but it was really my wife's fault, by the way. <laughs> Isn't that what Adam and Eve did? The woman you gave me, Lord, it was her fault. And she says, nope, it was the serpent's fault. <laughs> and what does the unveiled face mean? Unashamedly going before God and say, hey, we're screw-ups. Is there a towel in the chair in front of me? I messed up. And you know that God knows who you are. You know that God knows that you're uh, but dust. God knows I am a screw-up. And that's why he says here this. And we all with unveiled faces, I don't have to hide anything, unveil my face, all reflect the Lord's glory. Our being in process of being transformed into his likeness. The thing of it is, if you focus on Jesus and focus on Jesus and focus on Jesus and focus on Jesus, you're going to start looking like Jesus. And with unveiled face and not trying to make excuses, you go and you say, Jesus, who are I want to worship you, Jesus. You become like what you worship. Unveiled faces, knowing that God has written something across my heart and he's out and committed to me to transform me from my faults and my wickedness into Someone that's more like Jesus. And I don't want to strive to become more like Jesus. I just want to look at Jesus and let him do it. And if I'm willing, he is more than willing. And I have found that it is an ongoing process. And there is this ever-increasing glory thing that I'm really, I'm really digging today. I like the glory of, of the aroma of God. In this place, I love to be able to say, I can't explain it. God did it. I like the fingerprints of God. I like the glory of God. I like when people come and say, you know, the Spirit really spoke to me today, and, and I'm, I'm a different person because of what the Lord said to me. And I go, all right, thank you, Jesus. I don't say, yeah, I knew I planned that. No. I like the story where the guys are going before God and they say, Lord, when did we see you hungry? When did we see you thirsty and feed you? When did we go to prison and when did we bring you clothes? And when, when, when did we do all this? I don't know. I don't remember it. He goes, yeah, I know. You just found yourself doing it. As you followed what I wrote across your heart, you just find yourself doing my will. And it's an ever-increasing glory and it's a process of transformation. And so... Folks, get this. I want you to be unfrustrated today. You don't have to be, make yourself perfect. You just look at Jesus. Uh, it's an ongoing transition. And God will do it. God has never left it up to you except to say yes to him and follow him. Yes, there is sacrifice. Yes, there is pain. I have known pain. I have known sacrifice. But I have no regrets. I have no regrets. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. I've got freedom. Freedom from myself. Freedom from the expectations of other people. And... I have a freedom that brings me joy. And I am happy because I am not self-confidence. I have a confidence in God that God is standing with me and backing me up. And I don't have to worry about what anybody thinks. I have a new freedom. I've been to the mountain. <laughs> yeah, I have been to the mountain. And I find out the only one worth pleasing and living for is Jesus. And that's going to manifest in my life. It's going to, like, flood out. Sorry. 
Not really. Jesus just wants to flood out. And freedom is the tool of joy and flooding. God wants this more than you want it. And he has provided and invested for you to say yes to him and overflow you. Fill you with his spirit. Flood you with freedom. Are you ready for this? Are you ready for a peace that will stand the crush of this world? Are you ready for a freedom that no one can put you into bondage with? You know, I'm almost enjoying this stuff. You know, people make you question, and then you realize your source, and you get happy. And it's fun. And I am so happy to tell you that you can go into the very presence of God, unveiled, unashamed, because of the work of Christ. And you can be used of him. And God says, I'm investing in you, and I'm empowering you, and I'm sending you out as my witness to your family, to your work, to your office, to your school. And I'm sending you here, and I'm sending you there, and I'm going to give you divine appointments, and I'm calling on you to represent me, and I'm going to fill you with my spirit to accomplish that work. And you keep coming to me unashamedly. Tell me, don't try to... Don't try to dismiss your sin. Say, God, I messed up again. Just unashamedly, unveiled face, go before God and be transformed. Let's pray. Father, how beautiful it is to hear the truth of your word that makes us free. And we recognize it's not our own doing that has brought us this freedom and forgiveness of sin. It's your work. And you are the author. You brought us into the faith. And you will perfect us ever increasing. We are being made like Jesus. And we want to say, Lord, we want to lift up our voice to you and just praise you. When we understand this, the only thing we say, thank you, Jesus, and praise you.